few journals that we should pay for subscriptions so that we can function. But what's happening here is there's a revolution happening in the publishing world and is driven by hidden incentives that you don't even see. So for example, and I was going to ask town this, there's that ISBN, you, you know, you have to have uh, ISS, what is it called? Yeah. I, an ISS rated journal, whatever the ISS stands for. So the ISS rated journal, if you're a university in South Africa, you can publish till it comes out of your ears. But what counts for your subsidy from government at university is whether you have published in an ISS rated journal. ISI rated, I, ISI rated, I, ISI rated yeah. journal. Yeah. So it's one of the counting, uh, one of the um, uh, indicators of success is this ISI rated journal. And so, so there's that. And then I was just asking this while we were talking, what journal does he publish in? Because he's a very well known uh, researcher and publisher and one would expect him to be, to be thinking carefully about which journal he publishes in, because he wouldn't publish, you know, the Claremont Bugle. <laughs> he would want to publish in the global uh, bird journal of the world, given his status. So there's a funny thing happening in this, in this arena. There's status. Then there's also a built-in quality assurance for this ISI journal. And I was just asking whether he knows whether any of the open access journals are ISI rated. Because that, if, if there was, and if we could get there, then uh, uh, University of Kinshasa, when you go to the chancellor, you say, no, this is an ISI rated journal. It's open access. This is where I want to do my put. This is what we should be uh, having on our system, and this is where I want to publish. But it's a vicious circle of prestige, incentives, universities, publishing, publishers, and it's an int interesting your analysis. Uh, because having just been involved with GBIF, and we came, we had a financial crisis, and we're looking at cutting where we can cut. And he came to me and said, we spent a million rand on international journals. Uh, and typical bureaucrat with all these scientists who are so pure, I just said, cut it in half. What? You know, dumb science, you know, dumb, dumb science, you know, you're destroying the fabric and the excellence of science. But you only to find that a lot of those subscriptions were just people's pet journals, of which maybe one or two people would have used. Also, at the time, I was wishing that all of this could be one open access and on the way, you know, that the old way of doing it, which is uh, putting it into the Journal of Applied Entomology and getting critiqued and then coming back, that something, somehow things must change. But standards obviously always have to be maintained, and that's where they keep the, the reviews of journals. The better reviewing, the more stringent standards, it's more prestigious for you to get in. Whether that translates into more useful is another matter. So I, I wanted to ask you the question after all of that. Are, open, are there any open access journals in our sector that is ISI rated? Yes, definitely. Okay. Several in the PLOS uh, group, several in the BMC group. Uh, yeah, quite a few are now in the you know, very respectable two, three, four, five, six range in, in terms of impact factor. Now, there you said it's a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. Do you know who does the impact factor calculations? It's one of the publishers. And so they rig the game. And in fact, everybody, these are not dumb people in any way, shape, or form, they know or they reverse engineer and figure out the formulas for impact factor. 
And so they... It's different from a citation factor. Yes, it's, the citation rates are part of the impact yeah. factor. But what they're doing is they're essentially playing the game of how, how do I manage my journal so as to raise that impact factor. And so I see this very clearly in a bunch of the journals that are kind of my bread and butter journals. All of a sudden are doing quick turnaround rejections. So instead of sending, you know, my paper to Les and my paper to this person and that person, no, they just reject it. Because a quick turnaround and a high rejection rate are part of that formula. And another thing that they'll do is they'll keep the length down so that they can do more papers. And so you'll see like Journal of Biogeography has this very restrictive length limit where you almost can't describe one minimal publishable unit in biogeography in that, in that length of a paper. So the really vicious part of this is that those impact factors are invented by and managed by the publishing industry and played by the publishing industry. I have a question over here. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I just wanted to answer a little bit on the discussion about the publication, especially some of the aspects that you raised, so and I struggled a little bit to hear. But in South Africa, unfortunately, we've got two measurement criteria. And unfortunately, specifically with regards to publications, it is um, mostly managed by the Department of Education. So in South Africa, at an um, educational institution, the, the a publication of a journal paper in a, in a accredited journal, and that means it's as I list plus some others, which is accredited by the by Department of Education, amounts to about 150 to 180,000 rand for the institution. So it's a lot of money, and that's the incentive. Okay. On top of that, for you to in South Africa as an academic, whatever, climb the career ladder, you have to do NRF rating. Now, the NRF rating, unfortunately, you have to publish in ISR rated journals, you have to have accredited journals, you have to have poor peer, proof of peer review, and all of those kinds of things, as well as this um, citation index, your H factor, and all of that. So, that's just the scenario that we deal with. Now, to come back to some of the comments that Tan made, which is very important, the world is really changing. I mean, we see it with everything. Open access, I think, is the way to go because information is, is just turning to be a free a free commodity okay um, and this is still in academia I think we still sit with the remnants but there are ways to work around that and one of it is basically when you publish your research unfortunately you, we have to at this stage publish in some of these accredited journals but what you can do is on your personal home page create a white paper that discusses some of that research which you then condense into a paper Okay, and things like that. So you can really work around it and make some of the information that is important available um, free. And I think that's one of the avenues that we should perhaps also promote uh, as custodians of biodiversity information, is to, to create these kind of spaces where people can say, okay, guys, I'm working on this, this is open information that I make accessible in these formats or whatever. And from this research, the following publications was generated, and then you play the game both ways. Okay, because you do have this citation and standing and climbing the ladder, but on the other side, you do make the, the information as freely available as possible given the situation that we deal with. That is what I would suggest, and that's what we often do. I mean, you can't really work around that. I don't know whether that makes sense. But to, to come back, I really love that cycle. Because I mean, nowadays there's such a lot of technology that can play impact, and that can play a part in each one of those leaks that you talk about. Yeah, so yeah. I would like to just explore some of those topics later. Let's you know, do that. With you. Great. <laughs> I don't know whether that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You know, there are avenues by which you can take these things on. Funding agencies uh, and institutions can make declarations. Um, so, for example, the Wellcome Trust basically just said, if we're going to fund research, 
the research is going to be open access. Now, our National Institutes of Health did that. And right now, there is a bill pending in the US Congress called FASTER, F-A-S-T-R. And this is, this is basically all US government funded research would be open access after a, a certain embargo window. I think it's six or 12 months. But there's nothing to prevent South African institutions, African institutions, uh, funding agencies, from making declarations of that sort. What we did at the University of Kansas, which only cost uh, four of us about three years of work, was a declaration by the faculty, so by the professors, that we grant KU, the University of Kansas, a license. It's not a transfer of copyright. We granted a license to serve copies of our publications a priori. So again, the paper that I haven't written yet, KU already has my permission to serve a copy of it. So we followed on the model of Harvard and Stanford and MIT. Those are large private institutions that have quite a bit of luxury to, to experiment. And you know, they did a wonderful experiment. Um, so then we came in as the first public institution with a faculty-driven uh, open access policy. That's, I love, I love yeah. that. But as I say, you know, I, I think nowadays if we have to, we live in a changing world. And I mean, that, there I agree with you. It's not either or. It's changing. Yes. And we must be creative about, about you now moving into the new direction, but still play the system. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't have a choice, okay? Um, especially in South Africa, I think it's going to take a while for that to change. But the thing is, you can play the system, and it can be both. So I always say, when the world is changing, play both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. So we can make it available online, and, but also do this. Just make sure that you don't transgress the law, in a sense. And, so. and to any you know, younger academic, yeah, exactly. you have to publish in those journals. That is the bread and butter, and that's how you will be evaluated as a biodiversity scientist or as an informatician. In an academic world, it depends on publishing in those journals. But if your information is freely accessible, even though you've got a kind of a report or a research report, which is freely accessible, and from that you derive some research publication, you're also much more cited immediately because your Quite work true. is available. Quite and, true. And you know, that's the other thing. You must. This is part of it. You know, yeah. to play. But anyway. Quite true. My, my little bit of comment here. <laughs> I'm going to come over to Selwyn with another question. One comment and move on to the issue of open access. Sorry. If, um, you need to speak louder. I'm just trying to get my thought together. Let's listen. Take your time. We also want to, I also want to just mention the issue of software. Now, on, on the journal side, I think what we need to recognize is that the uh, European Union is looking at limiting the profit margins from, from uh, journal um, companies in, in the European Union. And perhaps that's a similar route that other countries can take, uh, other regions. Uh, and that seems to be sensible in some way as well. The other point I want to make is that... Let, let me jump in for a quick second. We had access to an industry summary about profit margins on indexed ISI rated journal the profitability per paper, five to seven thousand dollars of profit to the company for each indexed journal publication. Five to seven thousand dollars per paper. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. I, I just love the way that Europe and America is moving to a socialist model. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making everything <laughs> universally accessible. The issue of open access software and tools, and the challenge we have in SAMB is that we do not have the skill set. At university, we were trained in the proprietary software of R ESRI, ESRI. If you come into the industry, into, into working environment, you don't have the skills and you also don't have the opportunity to learn because you are putting basically shoulder to the ground and getting the job done. So, I mean, that's a big challenge. There's a big challenge for many African countries in that all the training that comes that we receive and all the support that we receive initially is with us big, large multinationals that use the opportunity to provide training and, and, and startup support as leverage 
further investment into their, uh, the, the, uh, their, their tools and, and software. So that is a, it's a bit of a longer term challenge. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, there are certainly big advantages to opening source code. And in, in my little bit of this field, ecological niche modeling, we see that where one of the most popular platforms is closed access. It's distributed freely. You can download it right now, but you can't see the source code. And so you have no way of asking, is this program doing what it says it does? Because there are errors in everything. And many of the other platforms that are available are simply R scripts that are completely open. And so while the closed access uh, platform is very powerful, very useful, and very popular right now, my guess is at the end of the day, the open source programs will, will win in the sense that they are more verifiable, more correctable, more changeable, more adaptable, simply because you can get in there and so why don't you have a proliferation of Linux and open office? Yeah, you're getting far too well, <laughs> in principle, I, I think in the, sci in, in the science world, like we see this in phylogenetics, niche modeling, and I'll, people just behind you. So I'm just saying, why don't you stand around? Yeah, no, I have I have no place to stand. I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, but but we're seeing a massive movement of all of the scientific programming to R, where it's an open program, open platform, and the scripts are simple text-based. So I think that's happening. And I think it will continue to happen because you have a generation that's more programming savvy, and you have a generation that's more um, wishing to muck around with the code fix it, play with it, extend it, change it, and use it. So I think that'll happen. I think that is happening. 